Hello, everyone, and welcome to another interview for the Fight Site. Uh, today, we once again have Tommy joining us, but uh, believe it or not, more importantly, we have uh, Jimmy Pedro, who is a two-time Olympic medalist, uh, world champion, I believe, as well, in judo, uh, I, the U.S. Judo Federation. I can try and mumble, bumble my way through his credentials, but I think, Tommy, you're better suited to actually properly convey that to our listeners well uh yeah two-time olympic bronze medalist 96 and 04 1999 world champion one of only uh, two uh, male world champions that the united states has had along with mike swain um arguably the the most accomplished uh, american male judoka of all time um i would say so um and now the uh the leading coach i think uh it's probably fair to say in, in the united states i don't want to do any uh, disservice to, to Mike Swain or Jason Morris or any other guys, but you know, I, I think you're it, Jimmy. So, uh, extremely excited to have you on the podcast and to ask you for uh, thoughts about, about your career, about the state of judo. Um, and because we are a broad based MMA site about um, MMA, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, how those have influenced judo, um, we can really take it wherever you want to go. But, um, you know, just kind of for a start, um, what uh, what are you doing these days with uh, coronavirus? How is uh, how's are you guys getting any training in? What how are you managing that? Well, it's really it's really impacted my businesses quite a bit. Um, I actually I run a school in the Boston area, so I'm one of the national training sites for United States Judo. And you know, obviously, judo and grappling, there's no way to social distance, so you know we're shut down. Uh, thankfully, you know we're we're very tech savvy. We're doing a lot of online classes, online curriculum yeah. for our students. We have Zoom meetings um, every every day for our you know online classes for our students all the time. We have mat chats. Uh, I've been taking a lot of my elite students through like the history of my career actually. So I've all been really? playing all of you know our teenage teenagers and above and all of our elite students. I've been doing a walkthrough of all of my major competitions. So taking them back to when I was 20 years old and competing in my first world championships, you know, sharing with the memories, the stories, the sort of how I felt and my mindset. And we've done like the 1991 Worlds. We did the 96 Olympics. We did the 99 Worlds. Just yesterday, we did the Athens Olympics. And we've walked them through each of those competitions each week just to keep them motivated, keep them inspired, uh, getting them to ask questions. I've given them all, you know, free my free DVDs on gripping and how they can, you know, what sections they need to study. And we talk about the finer points online. Um, I'm giving them training programs to do at home. You know, it, it varies from person to person what they can do, right? Mm, so sure. depending on the situation, whether they're by themselves or they have a training partner, trying to give them programs to train at home. So that's one business I'm trying to say, which is my judo school business. And then I'm also – um, 50% owner of, of Fuji Sports, the gi and, mm -hmm. gi and gear company. But again, we sell to dojos, right? So every dojo is yeah. closed. So people don't need a whole lot of new cool training gi gear when they're training by themselves at home. So the business is really down, obviously. Globally, the business is down. So yeah. trying to figure out how I can resurrect that. We did just get our PPP loan on Monday. So we're, that next week, we're bringing back some of our staff and we're trying to ramp oh, up. Great. As dojos open, and then the other business I'm I'm the owner of is Fuji Mats, and mm -hmm. again, you know Fuji Mats we sell the dojos, a lot of demand from people setting up home gyms, you know training at home type environments and cleaning products and things like that, which is keeping us alive. And again, we got the loan, so Monday the the full staff of Fuji Mats comes back full time um, for the last six weeks. Just me and my partners have been running the business and yeah. handling inquiries and stuff. So. You know, just trying to do our best, but it certainly hasn't been dull for me. It hasn't been really slow. I work yeah. out of home all day anyway, and so for mm -hmm. me, it's like business as usual. Get up, get my coffee, go upstairs, you know, do my work on my computer, go downstairs, grab a workout in the afternoon, come back up. The only thing I'm not doing is going to the dojo every night and teaching right. my students, but I'm doing online classes with them. I'm talking to them, so the days are flying by for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, for anybody who's uh, who's listening who might be a grappler, um, I can tell you as a as a black belt in judo and Brazilian jiu jitsu, uh, Fuji gis are very very high quality and an excellent value for the money. Uh, I actually didn't know that that was the same Fuji as the mats uh, and that you were involved with it, Jimmy. But uh, excellent product, so highly uh, highly recommend that. I actually so, 
uh, I have to buy one because my wife finally, after you know five years, has agreed to do jujitsu, and it only oh took my. being stuck. It, right. it took being stuck at home for two months. Right now. We got a Mother's Day sale going on right now: thirty-five percent off all the female women's geese on our on our site, plus free shipping over seventy-five bucks. So you're there. Okay. That's a deal. Yeah, I'm buying a gi actually right off after this. <laughs> so, so she, Jimmy, to, pandemic, to, but she said she'll do it. <laughs> to segue, uh, one of the things that you you mentioned there was that uh, you are uh, your dojo is one of the regional training centers for the United States national team, and I know that you have uh, very accomplished students, you know, Kayla Harris and Travis Stevens, folks like that. Are they there full time, or are they only uh, out there in Massachusetts with you for part of the year, leading up to big competitions? What's what's kind of the structure of uh, the training for your your elite athletes? So after I retired from sport, um, and I was run, I was running a dojo since 1997, right? So for kids and students, and even people that want to compete, I've had a dojo. But when I retired from competition, I started becoming a professional coach. And as such, I created a program for elite athletes. I went out and I bought a two family home um, where I could house eight athletes. I created like it has a common living room and then there's eight separate rooms that we've turned into bedrooms. And so I have an accommodation for eight full time athletes to live and train here. Um, people like um, Ronda Rousey, Travis Stevens, um, we had um, Alex Odiano, we had Radu Brestian, we had Taraje Williams Murray. We, we've had a lot of our former Olympians actually l move here full time and train full time. Um, when I was the national coach, if they lived in a different location or they trained at a different training center, they would just come here for national camps. But um, the ones I mentioned to you there, Travis lives full-time and trains in Boston full-time. Mm -hmm. Kayla lived and trained in Boston full-time since she was 15 years old. Um, Rhonda came out here for like three years and lived and trained in Boston for a stint of three years' time. So those athletes are full-time at the training center all the time. And then obviously they go overseas to compete or international training camps, but this was their home base. Rick Hahn was another one who was an MMA fighter. Rick lived and trained in Boston full-time. He made this his home. He now runs a gym. Yeah, locally as well. Yeah, Rick was in my weight class when I was competing. It, it never went well for me. Um, <laughs> He's a strong, tough guy, man. He's good. Rick, Rick Hahn and um, uh, RJ. Uh, yeah. Yes. Cohen. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, and I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Indiana, so uh, I got to I got to deal with the Coens a lot at, at tournaments. Also, really went well for me. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of the folks are coming out there once they're already established competitors. How different is it to train somebody who is already uh, very skilled at judo and coming out to you to kind of get the finishing touches and, and bring themselves up to the world level versus uh, growing the folks from the, the ground up? How, do you have very, really different approaches for those? Or do you train everybody kind of the same way? You know, what's interesting is that, you know, what I find is that a lot of the, a lot of the people that come here as elite athletes if they come here too old, meaning if they're already in their sort of early 20s, it's, a diffi it's, diffi it's difficult to change them because they've already had some success and they've won at the national level. But there's a big jump in, in judo from the U.S. national level to the international level. And it's, it's, it's light years difference. And because they're having a lot of success at the national level, they don't really think they need that. They don't embrace change. They don't embrace new training habits, new techniques as readily as the young ones do. So where I found we've had the most success is when they come here when they're around 15, 16 years old. That seems to be the sweet spot because they've already established themselves as having a lot of talent, having some toughness, but they're like sponges when they're 15, 16, right? Their habits haven't already been molded and, and ingrained in them. And that's where we've seen the most success. That's the age that, that Rhonda came and lived here. That's the age that Tra um, Kayla came and, and lived here and trained here. Travis was a little bit older, but at the same time, um, Travis was only 17 years old when he started in the program that I was in charge of, which was called the United States U23 Elite. Under 23 years old, I identified 20 of our most talented kids, and he was in a training program where I got to see him and interact with him enough times that he bought into the system. Now you use an interesting word there, which is system, because uh, in, in my experience coming up to the U.S. judo scene, the systems are kind of rare. Um, so what's what's kind of your thoughts on uh, the state of U.S. judo coaching in general, and also? 
to the extent that I, I know you have a system for training. Um, your Grip Like a World Champion DVD, I actually think, was the maybe the first systematic approach to gripping, for example, that I ever saw. And I was already a black belt when I got it. Um, what, what, what are your feelings on uh, coaching in the U.S. and, and kind of how did you develop the system that you do use with your athletes? So two different questions, right? The first one is about coaching in the United States. Right now, the biggest flaw that we have in the United States judo is that we don't have professionalized coaching. You know, the sport is not professional in our country. So, you know, the, the national team coaches, they're not paid, you know, and it's really tough to take somebody who, you know, to take a volunteer, put a lot of expectations on them, expect them to travel the world on the world circuit for six months out of the year and not make a dime from it. You know, that's really, really difficult to pull people away from their families. So it becomes a hobby and it becomes like whoever has the time gets to go, you know, and, and that's not right for the athletes. And it's not right for that coach because he shouldn't have to like figure out how he's going to make a living and coach the United States judo team. Right. And, and I was in a fortunate enough situation at the time where my dad was retired. Right. And he and I have the same we, we because he create helped me create the system. He was my teacher. I understood how he thought. I was a student who took his system and evolved it to a whole nother level, exposed it to the international world, tested, in, improved it, and made it our own. Um, you know, I was able to like his brain and my brain are very similar. So when he goes away, I know that he's teaching and reinforcing the same habits that I would if I was on the road. And so I was able to utilize my dad as an assistant coach to take the team everywhere. And then I would do the training when they were here. He would take them internationally. And then for the biggest and best competitions, we'd go together. And we'd have, they'd have the best of both. So that's why it worked for eight years when I was the head coach of the national team. And financially, I didn't need the money because I run my own companies. I make enough money. It, I, it was a lot, I could volunteer. And I felt like I owed it to the athletes who gave up their lives and moved here. And at the time, there was a lot of them. It wasn't just Kayla and Travis, mm -hmm. but I had quite a few others that were you know, hoping to be on the Olympic team that were part of the national team. I had like 15 full-time athletes here that were all national champions or national medalists that went around the world with us. So I sort of owed it to them because they sacrificed and gave up their lives to train in Boston. But after Kayla and Travis retired, you know, and were done with judo, and the other athletes also left the sport, now I have a young generation, and if I was the national coach of the U.S. team, I'd be doing it for everybody else's kids. And that's not fair to my family. It's not fair to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't respect my time and my professionalism. So that's why I sort of stepped away. But in terms of a system, you know, I grew up, my father's a student of judo. He didn't start judo until he was 19 years old. He was a workaholic. He was a workhorse. He was a tough guy. He was a disciplinarian. And he was somebody who just read books and learned like a sponge. And when I was taught as a young kid, we taught everything sequentially. That's the way my dad's brain worked. You know, much like Danaher has his system of jujitsu, my father has his system of judo, you know, and it's ne waza and if this, then that. And if the counter is that, you go to, you know, it's A, B, C, D, E, F iterations all the time, being one step ahead of your opponent on the ground, being one step ahead in the gripping sequence. So we just took that system. We said, hey, how do we make USA judo strong or athletes from the United States strong? Well, the rest of the world is very good in their feet. Everybody does tachi waza or standing randori, right? Or standing judo all the time. Where can we beat the rest of the world? We can beat them with better gripping, right? If we can, we can prevent their best techniques and we can execute ours. You know, it's basically hand control and wrestling and positioning and boxing. If you can control that position, then you've got a better chance on your feet. So gripping is an area of focus. The rest of the world doesn't focus on newaza or groundwork. So if we can become experts on the ground and we can, you know, drill the transitions hard from standing to groundwork and we can execute on the ground, we're going to win more matches and our athletes are going to have a greater chance of success. And I think, you know, the results of myself, Kayla, Rhonda, Travis, Marty Malloy, like there's not a single tournament that went by where all of us didn't win one or two or three matches on the ground. So obviously the Nawaza focus paid off. And then just physical conditioning, you know, making our athletes be stronger, better, tougher, physically and mentally. Like I think that the difference between the United States champions 
in the rest of the world is that mentally our kids are tough and we put them through grueling training sessions. We push them. We don't baby them. And on top of that, they, they're not spoon fed. They're not spoiled athletes. They're hungry and they're fighters. And if you look at, you know, Kayla had adversity in her life. She had to overcome sexual yeah. abuse. She had a purpose for fighting. You know, Travis's father walked out on him when he was young. He didn't have a father figure in his life. He grew up in, in um, boys and girls clubs. You know, he had a bit in his mouth and he had something to prove. He had fight in him. You know, Rhonda's father died when she was a kid, you know, and, and she had carried his legacy with him, with her all the time. So all of these kids had grit, toughness, and, and they wanted it more than anything. And mentally they were tough. And so by pushing them, you know, to their limits physically and using their mental fortitude as well as the gripping system, the Niwaza system and, and training methodology, we were able to beat the rest of the world with a very small group of people. Now, one of the things that you mentioned there was uh, using the gripping as a way of neutralizing kind of the, the more experienced uh, Tachiwaza of, of the international community. Has Have the rule changes that have been made over the last 20 years changed how you approach that, given that some of the unorthodox grips that used to be legal are no longer legal? Obviously, you can't attack the legs anymore. You used to be able to do that as a way of, of changing it up, too. Um, has there been a, a change to the way that you do teach because of the rule changes since the, the days when you were competing? Well, clearly there are certain grips that we can't do anymore, right? Um, the unorthodox grips are holding a grip for more than three seconds, you know, or without attacking immediately as a penalty. So they've had to make some adjustments to the way they grip and the cross gripping and things like that. But as long as you're offensively gripping, meaning mm -hmm. if I'm going to pull a sleeve by, I attack right away. Or if I take a cross grip, I make a movement, coach Igari, drag the guy behind me and then make a throw. As long as I'm using those same grips, but in an offensive way where I'm initiating attacks or initiating movement, they let it go. So mm -hmm. it's just a matter of learning to do it in a faster sequence and using it to, to uh, progress to attack much quicker. Are you, uh, are you a fan generally of uh, the rule changes that, that have been made since, uh, since your competitive days? Your thoughts on that? I think there's some good ones and there's some bad ones. Um, obviously, I do like the fact that you can't just run out there and tackle someone, right? I mean, double leg or diving at their, their one leg and picking it up. I think that, that can, I can see how they viewed that as sort of ugly judo. Um, but I, do, I think that as a true martial art, both offensively and defensively, I think it doesn't make sense that you can't grab a leg anytime. Because if I start a good waza or a good technique and I enter into the throw and I stumble my opponent – why can't I reach down and grab the leg and finish the throw cleanly? You know what I mean? I think so as yeah. a as a secondary attack to use the leg to finish, that's important. And that's what self-defense is too, right? So and, and likewise on the counter side of that, if I'm competing against a really tall opponent and he sticks his leg into me first, I should be able to grab the leg and pick him up and throw him with an offensive technique. You know, as long as we grip first and there's an attempt at throwing, so either as an offense or as a counter – I should be able to grab the leg. And I think that's I think that might come back in the future of judo because it is very dynamic and it makes up for it a little bit more excitement, in my opinion. Um, so I think, you know, not being able to touch the legs at all is a problem or, or something that I don't like about the new rules. But, you know, think about the, the new rules have much bigger geese, so it's easier to grip on the gi. That's that's a benefit, right? There's more time engaged in action versus just breaking grips all the time. So I think that's an improvement. The ability to do continuation in Nawaza. Mm -hmm. So if you're, they're giving you longer periods of time to work on the ground. I think that's good for the sport. Obviously, with the growth of jiu-jitsu and the knowledge worldwide that people have now of groundwork, there's more people that are likely to watch judo because they understand what's going on as well once yeah. people hit the ground. So that's, you know, there's some good things and some bad things. It's I like the fact that there's no referee decision anymore. The athletes decide the contest on the mat. It's done. You have to score to win, you know. So things like that. It's it's good and bad. If I may, um, quick question for. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Tommy does, but what were the official reasons behind these rule changes? Was there a specific purpose to them, or was it just what was the reason behind it? So you know, the 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 International Judo Federation is very statistic based. They they have statistics like you would not believe in terms of every weight class, 
which throws and which techniques per weight class score the most epones. You know, uh, how matches a one epone versus scores or osaikomis, you know, submissions. They, they have the stats on everything in Europe um, and worldwide. But one of the main reasons why the leg grabs were taken out of the sport was that, if you remember, there was talk at the Olympic level of removing wrestling from the Olympic Games, you know, because yes, yes. it was similar to judo and why do we need all these grappling sports and not that many countries worldwide participate in wrestling and whatever. So judo really wanted to separate itself entirely from wrestling at the time. It didn't want to be seen in the same conversation. This is a martial art. There's no leg grabs. It's vastly different than any form of wrestling. It's all about throwing. It's about that's why you saw a big push towards, you know, respect, discipline, honor. You know, the martial arts code. It came in like really integrity, um, competing fairly. Um, you know, all of the, the the altruistic things that you get from martial arts were really brought to the forefront, along with. No leg grabs, no attacks, no like, you know, sort of ugly, if you will, but more technical, finesseful sport. So you mentioned the, the, the greater time that we had that's allowed in a was now. And uh, that certainly showed in uh, in the last Olympics. I mean, uh, watching Travis pass people's guards was uh, was beautiful, uh, you know, for me as a, as a jiu jitsu guy and, and judo guy. But uh, to what extent do you think? The popularity of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the United States, especially, has has changed the culture around groundwork, or, or has it even? Has, has it actually brought up the level of uh, of Nawaz in general in uh, in American Judo? And conversely, has it had any effect around the rest of the world? Um, I think that a lot of Judo players are are you know a lot of them are practicing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at their dojos because a lot, of, especially in Europe, a lot of the shared facilities. The jiu-jitsu guys use the same facilities as the as the judo guys do, and in and in Europe it's the exact opposite of what we have here in America, right? In in Europe, judo is the number one sport, right. Olympic level, and the the biggest martial art in Europe is judo. Um, they're they're astounded in the in the by the United States and how jiu-jitsu is so much bigger than judo and even karate and taekwondo and they they, they just scratch their heads in bewilderment as to how that ever happened, but. Um, so, but Why do you think that is? For a lot of reasons. Judo was, judo was always promoted as a very um, noble sport, and the instructor was almost shamed into ever being able to make a living from the sport of judo. You, you, know, you don't charge your students. You don't profit from your students. It's from you know, the hair and back help others. And right from the beginning, it was not ever about money. And the problem with that is that, you know, if you don't can't do it full time, right, and you can only do it after work, you can only teach from six until whenever, six till nine, right? There's only so many people you can have at your judo club from six to nine. And at the same time, are you really getting the best instructor who had to get up at six o'clock in the morning and go put a, an eight hour day in at work, then drive to the dojo? And does he even think about what he's teaching or his curriculum or has he? Has he marketed his place at all? He pretty much takes whoever walks in the door. So it's hard to grow a dojo as well and run it professionally. So the average judo dojo in this country probably only has, you know, 15 to 30 people in it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not a lot of students. And it's typically one size fits all. So if you're a white belt, you're in the same class as the black belt. You know, or if you're a kid, you're in the same class as the adult. There's not really a good experience given. You know, there's no curriculum. Typically, the guy teaches whatever. There's no method to the madness. So they're really recreational dojos, mm -hmm. whereas jujitsu came in from the beginning as a business. At first, it became, you know, obviously it came to the United States as through MMA, right? It proved through through the Gracies that it's the best form of self-defense. You know, we'll take on anybody, anywhere, anytime, and we'll show you, we'll submit you, right? So the, through the UFCs, they said, wow. And it shocked the world to see all these big, strong wrestlers and boxers and kickboxers. How are they getting submitted by these skinny guys? Right. So it shocked the world. And then all of a sudden, everybody said, I got to take jujitsu to learn to protect myself. But when they came, they didn't teach for free. They came in here and said, hey, I charge a premium. I'm the best. You're learning from the best. I'm going to charge you 200 bucks a month. People said, sure. Where do I pay? Because I want to be able to beat everybody up, too. You know, and. 
from the beginning it's done as a business. And every single Brazilian that's ever come to this country, they come here for the land of opportunity. What do they do? They find a place where there is no jujitsu and they go set up shop there and they make it their home. And once they grow their club to a certain level, they take a blue belt or a purple belt and say, go open another school, go open another school. Mm-hmm. Well, in this, and they grew throughout the United States by, by finding out where, where jujitsu wasn't big and setting up shop and making it their home. And then finding out, you know, association to do business with or to, to, you know, piggyback off and have a sense of team. But it was done as a business from the beginning. And look, at the price of the geese is, is twice as much or three times as much as the judo gi. You know, the, it, it's become a culture in the United States. It's become a brotherhood. You know, and I see jiu-jitsu very similar to what, like, uh, you know, the bikers are. Harley Davidson bikers, right? What do they do? That's where they spend their disposable income. What do we want to do? We want to go ride on weekends. We want to be around guys our age. We want to do things together. Jiu-jitsu gives that to the young generation, right? Ages pretty much 20, 22 to like 45. That's your sweet spot for jiu-jitsu. Most young single guys get into the sport as a way to stay in shape after high school, after college. They've got money to spend on something, a hobby. What a great hobby to spend it on. Getting in shape and hanging out with other fit guys, right? And, and going and watching MMA events together, you know? Uh, going to local grappling shows together and, you know, having a bite to eat and getting together on Saturdays and rolling and just talking shop. I mean, it's, it's a brotherhood. Yeah. I I think there's a lot to that. You know, uh, I I don't know about you, Ben, but uh, speaking for myself, um, I think almost all my, my male friends that I see with any regularity, it's either at judo or kickboxing, you know, that's, uh, that's, the social part of it is uh, is definitely huge, and I think absolutely. you're absolutely right about that, Jimmy. Before the pandemic, that was pretty much it. <laughs> that was literally it. it's just my jujitsu people, and other than that, like on the weekend, uh, I might see some of my actual friends from like childhood and stuff like that. And yeah, judo, you know, unfortunately, not only did judo not professionalize its coaching, but um, it didn't do a good job of marketing itself ever. Mm-hmm. You know, it really went towards the sport more than anything so all about rules all about sport like if you think about judo used to have a lot of katas you know a lot of pre-range movements a lot of self-defense much like jiu-jitsu it had you know it had you know knife defense gun defense attacks you know how to defend against attackers that whole um art and craft of teaching that disappeared people don't know how to teach that anymore like there's not very many coaches or any dojos in the country that even offer that for the self-defense side of judo. So, you know, we lost, we missed the boat mostly in the, in the 60s and 70s. Judo was the number one martial art in this country. And then along came things like the Karate Kid. Things like, you know, seriously, the Karate mm-hmm. Kid came along and, and karate became mm-hmm. really popular. Um, and then... Um, what was the other one? The, the other one was pretty similar to that. But Taekwondo. What's that? Taekwondo Ta- came yeah. along. Yeah, I mean, they all – and listen, there's sharp business guys that said, hey, we can make a living doing this, and here's how you do it. And and they really learned, evolved business-wise. They came together. They they taught each other. They learned from each other. Judo just went right towards sport and the Olympic training, you know, training people for the Olympics. And unfortunately, that's very hard. You know, a uh, judo class, unless you're a young kid, it's really hard in the body to go, you know, and take judo. So instructors didn't didn't pare things down and, and just go for, like, the, the learning side of it. Most of the coaches, because they only have a small amount of time, it's exciting and fun to take people to tournaments and have your students win. Mm-hmm. Then I can prove how good a coach I am. But at the end of the day, like, what benefit is that to the person that doesn't even want to compete or be pushed to that level? Right. A lot of jujitsu schools, the students don't even compete. Right. They just right. like to train and have fun, get a workout, you know, and not be pushed into competition. Um, yeah. Uh, Tommy, I think you'd, you'd agree. This kind of it's really interesting what you're saying, because it sounds really similar to Arthur's point of view on a lot of these things. Um, for, uh, Arthur, by the way, for those who may not remember, we interviewed him as well. Um, he's the one who hooked us up with the interview with Jimmy actually. So thank you again, Arthur. But, um, he was described, he kind of was saying one of the things we asked him and he was talking about is like, I run my, one of the things people need to learn from jujitsu is how to run a school 
like a jiu-jitsu school and he he mentioned he has like 80 or 90 kids um as opposed to the, and, and not including adults and also said the same thing with you where it's like it's not every kid wants to compete some kids want to love judo want to do judo and then also have a regular life so right. yeah so it's really interesting that you're saying that because you know um sorry tommy <clears throat> no it's fine um so, you know, you, you mentioned kind of the sportification of, of judo and everybody being so focused on competition, and especially the Olympics. Uh, there's this big debate in jiu-jitsu where some guys really want jiu -jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu to, to try and become an Olympic sport. And then another part of the community is like, no, that would actually be the worst thing that would happen to jiu-jitsu because then that becomes the whole point of it. Like it, it becomes only about the Olympics. Do, do you think that judo being included in the Olympics was ultimately good or bad for its development as a, as a martial art and as a sport? I mean, I think it. I think it's good. I really do think it's good. It, I mean, if if judo didn't have the Olympics, it would be extinct. You today. think? Yeah. It would be extinct today. Yeah, I really do because, uh, you know, it, it it gives heroes to the kids to stay in the sport. It gives them something to aspire to. Uh, it certainly would be dead in the United States. I think if there was no no Olympic level judo. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but worldwide, I mean, the, the in in most countries like like France and like uh, Japan and Korea, uh, they have it in the school systems. Right. You know, so much much like what Abu Dhabi is doing now in jujitsu, judo did in all those other countries. You know, you can you can you can it's part of your physical education class. You know, you've got to learn judo, just like our kids go and learn uh, basketball and they have volleyball. Mm -hmm. and, well, in France, you just do judo. In Japan, you do judo. So it's in the school system. So the masses are exposed to the sport. Therefore, there's a greater awareness of the sport. And then they're also they have the ability to do it as a junior high school sport, as a high school sport, and do it in college as well. So it's in their school systems. And you can be on a team with other kids your age. You get to compete against other teams. And it's more fun when it's a team sport. You know what I mean? You have your individual competitions, but you also can win and lose as a team. So you're with other people your age. You're having fun doing it. It's recognized um, in the United States. Judo's not in any junior high school. It's in yeah. maybe other than Hawaii. It's probably only in ten high schools in America. You know, it's probably a club club sport, not even a varsity sport. And even in colleges now, the college system it's gone way way down. You know, there's only maybe a handful or a dozen colleges that actually have judo as a recognized sport. So. Yeah. You know, without being in a school system, it's look at all the competition we're up against in schools. You know, yeah. I, I tell it all the time, like judo is not accessible. It's not accessible enough as a sport for it to ever be, have a big following. Because if you think about jujitsu right now, you can pretty much go to any city in this country and they will have a jujitsu club in that city at this point. You, you don't have to drive more than 10 minutes or 15 minutes to get to a judo, I mean, to get to jujitsu school, right? There's one on every block almost now. So, but if you want to go to the nearest judo school and get started as a white belt, your dad or mom might have to drive 45 minutes or an hour. Are they mm -hmm. really going to take Timmy, who's six years old, or Johnny, who's 10, 45 minutes or an hour drive just to see if they like it? When in their own town, they can do karate, they can do taekwondo, they can do jujitsu, they can do baseball, soccer, basketball, hockey, right in their town, five minutes away. Like, you know, it's just, it's not accessible. And there's not, and, and even when they do get to a club or a school, it might be run by an instructor who doesn't really do a good job or know what he's doing. Not a great experience. So the school isn't, isn't a success. Is yeah. there a way for you to, do, do you think there's a way to, at this point, uh, what would be the first couple steps that would need to be taken in order to turn that around and make it more accessible i think right now the biggest what i've talked about the biggest opportunity for judo to grow in this country is is to actually partner with jujitsu schools and actually take our curriculum forget about the groundwork right we don't need to teach groundwork to jujitsu guys but we do need to teach takedowns so yeah. if if you ran a jiu-jitsu school and you wanted to become a certified black belt by United States judo under the, you know, everything in jiu-jitsu is about lineage, right? So if you said, okay, this is the Jimmy Pedro system of takedowns, right? A world champion, Olympic caliber coach, 
or we put five of our best coaches together. This is a certification program from Mike Swain, Jimmy Pedro, Jason Morris, all the best coaches. We said, here, here's the takedowns you need to know. We want you to know these 10 takedowns. Well, we're going to teach you the best way to get these takedowns and learn them. And now we're going to have you teach them to not just your students, but we want you to start opening up your school to kids. Because a lot of jiu-jitsu schools are adults only, or they're more like 70% focused on adults and 30% on kids. Because jiu-jitsu, quite honestly, it's challenging and difficult to teach to little kids, mm -hmm. and I think it loses their attention span. Whereas, because they don't have the control of their legs and their bodies like you need to. Plus, judo is a sport that you need to learn as a child, because when you get older, it's so much easier to learn because you did it as a kid. It becomes instinct. So I think it would it would allow the jiu-jitsu instructor to add something new to become a certified instructor or black belt in a sport with good lineage. And it would ultimately help him produce better all overall athletes if they stayed in his school and learned jiu-jitsu afterwards because they now have great takedowns and they're learning great jiu-jitsu. And instantly we could have a thousand clubs open up because there's that many jujitsu places around the world. And it's an opportunity for that jujitsu guy or jujitsu school to differentiate itself from the other jujitsu schools in the area. Because if we only said, okay, in your area, we're only going to allow one instructor mm -hmm. to be certified in this system. Do you want that opportunity? And they come learn from the national staff of USA Judo. And we could, you know, then we could spread it quickly. That's the quickest way to spread it in this country. Because mm. it would take us way too long to retrain all the old guys who've been doing it their own way for 30 years. You know, at my school, I've taught, I've taught green belts and purple belts how to teach judo. And they are better instructors than a lot of black belts in judo. Because they've learned one way, my way. This is how we do every technique. This is, this is the way you teach the kazushi. This is where we grab. This is where we step, extend, bend, turn, throw. Like they've been taught the system. So if we can teach that system nationwide and get everybody to do it the same way, then we, we, we can roll it out quickly. Well, if you ever if you ever start the class, I'll sign up. Actually, I went to a martial arts um uh, symposium uh, before the coronavirus and I had just had knee surgery and I was teaching and I taught 35 karate instructors how to teach judo and I certified them level one on three throws how to fall how to teach the throws how to drill the throws and I certified them level one of you know my judo system said hey they were willing to learn and teach their students and learn from one I did no, that'd be great. So, segueing a little bit, uh, one of your most famous students, Kayla Harrison, is uh, fighting now in MMA. Um, I'm just curious what your your thoughts are on that in general, uh, and also if you still does she still train with you at all? What's uh, what's what's going on with Kayla these days? So Kayla is Kayla's like a, a daughter to me and my family. She she's she's a girl who came here at 15 years old with nothing. Not a not a dime. Mother dropped her off. Please take care of my daughter. And we did. We looked after her from day one. So, you know, we obviously helped her through junior world championships and senior world championships and two Olympic gold medals. So and she's, you know, stayed at our house and babysits our kids. And, you know, we are we are like family. So um, after she won her second gold in Rio and we were at the press conference, the questions came. Kayla, will you ever do judo again? I said, no. Why? We're world champion, two-time Olympic gold medalist. There's, she's won every event on the planet. What is there to prove, right? She should be able to make a living from judo or from her accomplishments for the rest of her life. That was my hope. They said, oh, well, Kayla, will you ever do MMA? I said, why? No. Well, she, she's two-time Olympic champion. She should be able to make a living from her sport. Well, unfortunately... After the Olympics, all of the revenue dried up. She was getting paid as, a, as an athlete to train 100% in judo from United States judo. She was earning a salary. 
She was earning a salary from the Olympic Committee. So she, you know, she was making really good money from doing judo full time. And she had a sponsor, the New York Athletic Club, that was paying her monthly. Um, she had some endorsements. She had some sponsors. She was winning prize money on the, on the international circuit. So Kayla was making a really good living doing judo. Unfortunately, as soon as she stopped competing, no more money from U.S. judo, no right. more money from the Olympic Committee, no more money from sponsors. It goes to zero. And without any real endorsements or any commercials or any sponsors, if she's not going to compete anymore, sponsors don't want to pay her because they're not going to get the visibility. And unfortunately, there was no professional avenue for her at United States Judo, right? They had they don't pay coaches. They, there's no chance to go open a dojo unless you start it from scratch. So how does she make a living? We thought, well, let's go to the International Judo Federation and ask them if there's a role. She could be a you know a commentator, a spokesperson for you know woman, you know woman woman in across the world and and empower women's movement, empowering women in sports in in third world countries and underprivileged countries. Like let's get her to be an ambassador. It, it was you know not worth her time, you know what they were mm -hmm. offering. So unfortunately, she had no choice but to go the MMA route. And luckily, because I've been in the jiu-jitsu, judo, MMA world for the last 15 years through my companies. And I know every agent I've helped build almost every nice gym that exists in mixed martial arts. You know, I know everybody from, you know, Henzo and American top team and the guys in California. And so I just said, Hey, we'll get you somebody. And we, we got her an agent and we got her pitching, you know, different organizations. And at the time the world series of fighting stepped up and said, Hey, we will pay you just to train. Mm -hmm. We're going to give you this much money just to see if you like it. And listen, they signed her a two-year deal, gave her a really good salary. All she had to do was, you know, train MMA, not, not any place specific, but just try mm -hmm. it, see if you like it, post some social media stuff, and show up at our events and do some commentating for us. And they gave her a really good salary. So that's how she signed on to get started in MMA. And then at the time, my father took her to all the MMA gyms. I introduced them to a few of the coaches. She went, tried Sit Yud Tong. She went to Frankie Edgar's place. She went to Henzo's place. She tried like all these different places for MMA. And then finally, she said, you know, I, I, I like this. I like this training. It's different. It's fun. It's mm -hmm. new. I'm a white belt. You know, it's yeah. not judo all over again. So she, she started training. She really, really liked it. And then she said, okay. And she already had an arrangement with the WSOF that if you fight, then this is the, what you, we will pay you. And her first fight out of the gate is, is, is six figures. Yeah. So her first fight as a, as a first MMA fight, you're going to make six figures. Man, who wouldn't do that? <laughs> right? As a girl, you're fighting a white belt, fighting a white belt. The fights last a minute, two minutes. Yeah. She's a professional athlete. Yeah, she's a, yeah. a, a, a novice in MMA, but she's a professional athlete who's strong, who really has hundreds, if not a thousand fights under her belt in judo. And judo is a really competitive sport as a woman's mm -hmm. sport. Whereas yes. jujitsu is not that competitive on the woman's side. You know, boxing is not that competitive on the woman's side. I, don't, I mean, no disrespect, but I mean, worldwide, it's not that competitive. Well, so there's smaller talent pools, right? Judo has a huge a women's talent sport. pool internationally. Wrestling's a smaller talent pool. Boxing's a smaller talent pool. Jiu-Jitsu. Judo's got millions of women doing judo. It's a really competitive high-level sport. You know, it's been in the Olympics since 1988. I mean, in 32 years at the Olympic level, it's developed. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, she's used to fighting top-level athletes. Now she goes in there and she's fighting novice. They might be skilled in striking or skilled in something, but they're not well-rounded like she is. And they're not a professional work like horse like she is. So. Yeah. It was, you know, it was instant success. It was instant money. Three fights, her contract's over. Let's renegotiate. They were smart enough to make her the spokesperson and the, the celebrity of the, of the WSOF, which now is the PFL. Mm -hmm. And she's on billboards in Vegas. She's on, you know, ESPN. She's a, she's a phenom. She's undefeated. She just won their world title. She's made over two million bucks with the PFL now. I mean, who wouldn't do that? I mean, Good question. Do you so think she's going to, you know, now she's at a point where, you know, quite honestly, 
you know, because they give you a million bucks if you win the the, the, mm-hmm. the title. So she did that plus all of her other prize money. You know, she's into this for millions now. So good for her, you know. And then on top of that, now we're at a point where the PFL may or may not have any fights. This year could be a wash for her, which is really disappointing. Mm-hmm. But from what I understand, if they can't, if they don't find her a fight, they they they'll have to release her. She may end up at the UFC now. Hmm. That would be really interesting. It's I, I don't know who she would fight in the UFC just because they don't really have a a one fifty five division. But I'm sure they would find somebody. They'll probably um, do a catchweight or something. Yeah, it'd be the stage she deserves. Yeah. She'd probably fight like a catch weight at 150 first. Yeah. yeah. Catch weight fight at 150 for them just to kind of get, get her feet wet in the UFC and get the experience. Do a couple of fights and then maybe make the cut to 145. Do you think she could make 145? She could. Wow. The only trick that people don't know or the only thing about Kayla that people don't know is that she is hypoglycemic. She has oh, really, really blood sugars. So if she doesn't monitor her sugars right hmm. – He's a different athlete. So I learned this as the coach of the team. I said, I said, why is it that some days she's an absolute monster and nobody can touch her? And then other times it looks like she's falling over her own feet and she can't function. Like, I don't understand. So we had a, the, the nutritionist from the U.S. Olympic Committee actually come in and test her during training, her sugars. I explained that she passed out. She passes out sometimes on runs. Mm. And they said, well, she's hypoglycemic. And they actually monitored her sugars. And so if you ever watch Kayla compete in competition, you'll always see her run off the mat and run off out of the ring. And she runs off the mat after each match. That's to flush her system out of the adrenaline so she doesn't have huh. spikes in, spikes in yeah. her sugars. And then they always constantly are testing her blood and giving her food if her sugar's low or high. Like it has to sit in a certain limit for her to have success. So – my only concern with making 45 is that might throw off her sugars. Yeah. She's not the same athlete if she, if she has trouble either making weight or um, before fights if her sugar isn't regulated properly. Was she cutting much weight during her, uh, her international judo career? When she came to my school, she was trying to fight at 138 pounds. Oh, my gosh. She no was way. 138. And yeah. at the time, Rhonda was training here. So Rhonda was the 154-pound girl. Kayla – couldn't make 138 anymore. We obviously didn't want her to fight off against Ronda. So we said, hey, why don't you go up to the next weight? You go up to – it's 170 pounds. Right. Go up to the next weight. We'll build, we'll build you into a big, strong you know, workhorse. And she just started lifting weights. We got her a good strength coach. Hmm. She went to the gym six days a week. She started putting on muscle and putting muscle. And all of a sudden, she became this you know, jacked behemoth. And, you know, she, she's, uh, so she, she's now PFL 155, but she sits around 160. So oh, one, really? Oh my gosh. For her. Yeah, she's that's not a bad cut. Really well. I think, you know, she could make 55 with her eyes closed mm-hmm. and then obviously 10 more pounds, you know, it's going to be a challenge, but she could do that. Yeah. Well, that would be fantastic. I mean, there's, there's not really a 145 uh, division much to speak of in the UFC, but there are fights for her there that, that I would love to see. Personally, I would love to see her fight Nunez or Holly Holm or Cyborg. That, those would all be, uh, all be fantastic. Sadly, Cyborg's um, not there anymore. She's, oh, uh, that's right. That's yeah. Right. Physically, physically, nobody's going to match her. Physically, yeah. they can't. I mean, I, I, you know, we... My dad's been down training when she's she trains with Amanda, so we know we know a lot about Amanda. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're actually good friends too, so I don't even know if that. Oh really? Right. I didn't I know that. That's that interesting. Ever happened to be honest with mm-hmm. you, but certainly the other fights would. And if enough, if there's enough money at stake, anybody will fight anybody, right? Right. right. <laughs> or she or Amanda drops to stays at 135 and just is like, "Hey, Kayla, have 145. It's yours." Right. All right. Right. Let her just rule the roost there. Maybe. So, you know, Kayla's obviously having a lot of success and, and she comes from that high level athletic background that's that's very hard for other girls to to compete uh, with. The same would be true of someone like Travis Stevens, if he went to MMA. Obviously, the men's side is is more developed. Um, but you know, given that there aren't the professional opportunities in judo, but these guys are extremely skilled, extremely athletic combat athletes, do you think we'll see any more uh, movement from from judo to uh, MMA in the US among uh, among athletes? Uh, I'm not, you know, the hard part is 
the hard part is you're starting from scratch all over again, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you, if, when you do judo, you focus on it for so long and so hard that you're a professional and that consumes your whole day, right? You're doing that six hours a day between your judo training and your lifting and your running and everything else, right? So, and usually the guys that retire, they're not retiring until like they're in their thirties. So now mm -hmm. at 30 years old, can you really then now start something brand new like MMA? It's a, first of all, you're a white belt now in MMA, even if you're a great judo player, there's a, you got to learn the striking game. There's a lot of changes you got to make to your game. It, it's a whole new learning curve, and it takes a long time to get there. It's a, mm -hmm. Look at even Henry Cejudo, how long Henry has been doing MMA. Sure. He's had a lot of success, but don't forget, Henry retired as a wrestler in his early 20s. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he had all that time. When you're in your 30s, you don't have that time. You're not a stallion anymore, right? You're kind of going downhill. So uh, oh, yeah. it takes like six years to learn. You know, yeah, it's it's it, it's uh, it's hard because you've got to get humbled again. And then, of course, the road to the top at, now in MMA is so difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the best chance we have for judo is is to take our young number two, number three ranked people who really aren't going to make it on the international scene and take them at 22, 23 and throw them into mixed martial arts training environment. Yeah. And give yeah. you know, and let them go for five or six years. People that have been winning junior national titles, that are very, very accomplished um, athletes, and put them into mixed martial arts training camps and things like that, and let them have fun. But it it, it has to be sponsored by somebody, right? Somebody right. actually actually pay them to do it, you know, because as you know, you, you're going to starve as an MMA fighter for for a very long time before you're going to make any oh, yes. money. Do you think uh, a better avenue for, you know, judo players who maybe aren't necessarily going to, like you said, throw them in at 22, 23, but a lot of people want to continue trying at least for a little while, but maybe after people are done with judo at 30, do you think a better avenue would be competitive grappling in jujitsu? Like, you know, they can do Abu Dhabi or, you know, start in jujitsu, but at least they have that base and they can build up really sure. fast. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Okay. They can go that route. I think, I mean, Travis showed that, I mean, without training, Mm -hmm. I mean, Travis just, he stopped training after the Olympics, you know, judo training and didn't do any jujitsu and was taking super fights with, with these big name guys without really training for it. Just throwing his hat in the ring and just saying, I'll just wing it. I don't care. I'll fight. <laughs> like those guys are training all the time in their gyms. You know, they're, they're putting in six days a week and a couple hours of training session at least. And here's a guy who's coming out of an office, being on a computer and just going out, you know doing a couple of rounds with a couple of our guys, not really taking it seriously, but just having fun. Yeah. Well, Ben, that's, those are all the, uh, all the questions I had and we're, we're coming up on an hour. Uh, do you, do you have anything else? Um, I mean, I, I would be remiss to, to not ask, I guess, try and ask a few more uh, jujitsu related uh, judo questions from, I guess, a jujitsu standpoint. Um, uh, I, I'm a purple belt at Marcelo Garcia's, so uh, not a black belt, but hopefully one day. Uh, I, I wanted to know if there's, um, as I'm 28, you know, I have you know, a bunch of injuries already from jiu-jitsu. I do have an interest in, in, in learning judo. What would your, for somebody like me who isn't the, you know, the freshest, how would you recommend somebody like me get into judo? Find a good instructor in your ear. Find a good coach. Actually, you know, I don't know how far Kano Martial Arts is from you, but the St. Ledger, um, Gary St. Ledger and, and uh, Shintaro Higashi run Kano Martial Arts. It's in New York. I'm not sure how far from you, but they're good people. They do classic, like, good judo, clean judo. Um, look, make the focus on learning, throwing, and learning the techniques not necessarily worrying about doing the randori and the sparring and the fighting part of it, but like that's what I do with most of my adult, I'd say novice students, people that want to come and learn judo but don't necessarily want to ever compete. I don't even have them do the sparring. They hmm. come to class for one hour. We do judo-related exercises, conditioning. We do teaching, and we do drilling. And they do lots of uchikomis, fit-ins without throwing, uh, lots of movement drills. They're learning the good, basic, like technical side of judo. 
and they're breaking a profuse sweat and they're exhausted at the end of training. The ones that want to stay and do sparring or randori, they can stay. The rest of them, we allow them to bow out and they've had enough. But learn for fun and learn how to throw and learn how to do really good stand-up judo and enjoy it. After doing that for two years or whatever, and you say, hey, I really like this. I'd like to get into the sparring and take it to the next level and see if I can do it for real. At that time, your body will have done judo long enough that it's now hard enough to be ready for the randori. What typically happens is people do judo for three months and then they try to randori. And then they end up getting hurt because they really don't know it well enough. They don't understand the movements. You know, the people they're going with are other white belts and they don't know the movements either. And the likelihood of getting injured is much higher when you're working out with other novice people. So work out with skilled people. You're trying your hardest. They're just kind of holding you at bay and letting you try your stuff. And, you know, they'll throw you when they want. And that's how you'll learn much, much better. And you'll enjoy it more. And, and yes, you can still learn judo at 28 for sure. But you got a jujitsu base, you know how to fall, you know how to roll at least, right? But I don't think you need to like be taking hard falls or doing any sparring for at least, at least the first two years. Wow. Yep. You are the first judo instructor I've ever heard not recommend randori early and often. You uh, know why? It, hmm. Most of why? those because those people are trying to prove how good judo, how tough judo is, how good yeah. judo is, or how good they are. We don't need to prove anything. We want you to, we want you to learn. We want you to, only to stay in the sport. That's why people come and go out of the sport like a, like a revolving door. Bring them in the door, show them how hard it is, beat them up, and then they go out. I want to bring them in. Yeah. I want to teach them. I want them to have fun. I want them to drill hard. I want them to learn. I want them to get friendly with all the students, and I want their bodies to be ready for randori. If and only if they want to do randori. Yeah, it's such an interesting contrast because my my early days in judo are exactly how you describe. You start with a lot of people on the mat, and gradually they're all gone because they all get injured. They hate getting beat up. They're not learning enough. Whereas my my jujitsu coach, you don't spar for the first six months. You do positional drilling live, but it's very controlled. You do not roll for the first six months, and only after you've put in that six months and understand what it's about a little bit do you get to go live. So it's uh, it's really interesting to hear you say that, Jimmy. And don't get me wrong, our, our our novice students, when we do groundwork, I will allow them to grapple on the ground and have fun. Like they'll do sparring newaza stuff. Groundwork they can do because it's controlled, yeah. right? They're not going right. to get hurt. They don't need to fall. Judo's really three dimensional, right? You got to be able to leave yeah. your feet. You got to leave your feet and you got to do a somersault and land on the floor in the right position. It's really hard to do. If you start at 28, right? When's the last time, other than jujitsu, when's the last time a 28 year old actually did a tumble salt or a full roll? When they were in grade school, right? Yeah. When they took a gymnastics class in, in grade school as part of physical education. But they never really like, and when did they ever try to like do a front flip or even a back flip? Right. Never. So or cartwheels and like those things aren't normal to us. So mm -hmm. why make it like in three months, make somebody try to do that? It's like I equate it to gymnastics. When you go watch gymnastics at a really high level place. Ladies doing like a triple flip with twist and lands. What do you say when you look at that? I'll never be able to do that. It's true. When people walk into my dojo and they see Travis sparring with our team and it boom, boom, and the guy bounces off the floor, right? And he gets up like it's nothing. The people are like, what the? I ain't ever doing that. And nor should they. That's too high a level. You don't need to, right? So my approach is different. I mean, I, I, that's why I have 260 students at my school. Probably have one of the biggest judo schools in the country. Right, because it, it, every class is for that level. We have, you know, six and under. That's your class. I have a toddler program for two two-year-olds. I have a, you know, a novice adult class for a white belt through a green belt. You're in the same class with people your skill. That's it. You come for an hour. I know you can only take an hour of training. That's it. You're done. Physically, you're exhausted. That's good for you. You know, you want people that want to come back for more. Sensei, how do I do more? Come three days a week instead of two. You know what I mean? But don't train them for two hours. Like most dojos, most judo school, our training is two hours. 
How boring is that? Two hours, right? I didn't. I never trained for two hours. My elite class at my dojo, Kayla and Travis, never trained for more than one hour and a half ever. We get in, we get after it, we go hard, we go home. No it's water breaks, no sitting around on the sideline, five minutes rest. No, go, 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 go. Get in, get out. It's it's really interesting because, like, just from a personal standpoint, I, I relate to that extremely well. Because when I first started jujitsu, I came as a white belt. First of all, not a single white belt that started with me at Marcelo's is still there because they and they all started sparring right away. Two, three weeks in, they were already doing live rolling, and I didn't go to the live rolling class for four straight months. I was doing strictly drilling and I didn't have my first major jujitsu injury till I was four and a half years in. I blew up my ACL. It was not a great injury, but if I blew my ACL out after a year, I probably never would have gone back. Right. So it's, it's interesting. You're talking about like all this burnout from that kind of stuff. And I have no interest in doing judo to get to the Olympics because it's not gonna happen. I want to grow as a martial artist, improve my jujitsu. So at 28, that's the best thing I can do. Just drill and incorporate it into my what I already have going. Right. Um, before uh, before I let you go, if you have one more time for one more question, uh, we interviewed someone Hudson Taylor, who's a three time All American wrestler who's tra who's transitioned to jujitsu now, and he's had a lot of success. He as a blue belt world champion, purple belt world champion already. Um, he talked about how he thinks wrestlers can really benefit from June Jiu Jitsu in wrestling specifically, and obviously Jiu Jitsu growing would definitely benefit from wrestling. Uh, do you feel the same way about Judo for Nawaza, I guess specifically, but even maybe on the feet, certain things that can help you? For doing what now? Doing for doing wrestling? Judo, for doing Judo, uh, but look, doing Jiu Jitsu at the same time. Do you think it's beneficial for Judo players? I think to a certain degree it is. Um, certainly, certainly at the at the fundamental level, at the beginning level, as you're learning to learn the groundwork and you have a finer finer uh, understanding of the ground game, it'll definitely help and add to your judo transitions. It'll help your positions. It'll it'll lead to additional submission opportunities. So there's no doubt. Like early on, you should do jujitsu. At the highest level, when we get to sort of the Olympic level. That's where it's sort of – you can't continue to do jiu-jitsu as an Olympic judo player or a high-level judo player competing on the international circuit because we had a few athletes do that. But the reactions and the habits of jiu-jitsu is to pull guard and to go to your back. And if you go to your back in judo, you lose the fight. So Taraje Williams-Murray was an Olympian. He trained here. Uh, he was on the 2004 and 2008 Olympic team. He lives in, in Brooklyn. Um, but he came to Boston a lot to train. And he used to train jiu-jitsu. He used to compete in jiu-jitsu and do that. But what happened was there was a few competitions in judo where he lost by Ipone. He threw himself because he jumped to his back so quick. The guy did an action. His thing was to go to his back. He'd fall on his back, and the ref would call the full point for the other guy against him. So Taraji, like, that's where it, the habits are bad. Like, we have a guy at our school who's – he does both. He's a brown belt now in judo. He's a brown belt in jiu-jitsu under Travis. But every time he starts to fall, it's habit for him to go to his back. As he's falling, he never turns to his stomach. In, in judo, if you fall on your back, you lose. So at a high level, you can't continue to do both at a high level. Uh, you got to choose your path because the, 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 it's just same in judo, right? I mean, or in jiu-jitsu. If I was a judo player – and I got in a dangerous situation in jiu-jitsu, I might go to my stomach and turtle down and give up my back. I can't do that, right? So mm -hmm. that's where the, the sports go away again. So at the be mm -hmm. beginning base, absolutely, till probably like purple belt level, if you're going to seriously compete, then you got to go a different direction. If you want to be learn the best and do both and you don't really care about competition, you can do both forever. Uh, that's definitely – that's the last question I had. Uh, uh, Tony, anything before – we wrap up. No, just uh, thank you so much for the time, Jimmy. This has been a real treat and um, really enjoyed speaking with you. My pleasure, guys. Everybody support Fuji Sports, Fuji Mats. And anytime you're in the Boston area, come visit us at Pedro's Judo Center. Well, you I would love you, to. <laughs> yeah, I definitely would have to. I'm not that far from Boston. I might as well, you know. My pleasure. Um, uh, well, you did the shout out on your own, so that's perfect because uh, that's how we usually end. Um, thank you, Jimmy, again for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure. I, I feel like I benefited a lot just sitting and listening. Um, 
Everyone, make sure that you check out the fightsite.com. Phenomenal content. I cannot stress that enough. Uh, make sure you check out the Patreon as well. You get a lot of exclusive content. You could join the Discord. Uh, thank you uh, again, Arthur, for setting this up. And uh, everyone, make sure you stay safe. Be careful. You know, it's it's really important that everyone just stay safe and social distancing and all of that. Listen to doctors. Listen to the uh, people who know what they're talking about. And thank you again, Jimmy. Really appreciate it. All right, guys. Be good. Take care. Hope to see you soon. See ya.